Welcome and good morning. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along. My name is Neil Parikh. I'm the executive producer and occasional guest host of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest today is Ron Lieber, the New York Times Your Money columnist and author of The Price You Pay for College. You can follow him on Twitter at Ron Lieber. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan, Marshall Loeb Professor at the Stony Brook School of Journalism and co-founder of Digimentors. You can follow him at Sri. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We're also live on Ron's Twitter account. Thank you, Ron. Let's go ahead and start this week's show. We have a number of people watching. Uh, thank you, as always, Jonathan Borstein, uh, jumping in and offering us greetings from the East Village, uh, and Patricia Freudenberg, uh, another uh, loyal watcher uh, watching from New York. Thank you. Uh, please make sure to uh, hit share, like, comment, let us know where you're watching from, and uh, make sure to tag your friends. Let them know about today's show. It's certainly going to be very interesting. Anyone with an interest in personal finance, particularly with kids getting ready for college, will want to hear what Ron has to say. Uh, he'll also share some um, personal news. His father passed away earlier this month. May his memory be a blessing, of course. Uh, but he learned a lot about personal finance and planning uh, when someone has an illness. So we'll ask him about that as well. Um, in addition to that, the uh, New York Times has a great feature on sheet pan cooking. Uh, there's a, a really interesting op-ed on uh, from a, a nurse's point of view dealing with COVID, uh, and we'll also catch a little bit of the video from that as well. So shout out to Doug Levy joining us uh, at 5:30 in the morning in California. Uh, Amy Zopkin, uh, Zipkin rather, joining us from Connecticut. Uh, Ted Coltman joining us from Washington D.C. Our friend Ron Thomas joining us from Dubai. Thank you, Ron, for being such a great friend of the show. Jay Colin, uh, as well, joining from Brooklyn. Um, and uh, uh, Steve Taylor is part of our production team. Deborah is joining us from the Hudson Valley. Linda Lawrence from Long Island. Nikhil joining us for another uh, um, person joining us from Connecticut and offering condolences to Ron, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Makran Boot, Boot and... Uh, I have to give a shout out to my mom, uh, always uh, tuning in Sunday morning, regardless of where she is. She hasn't been traveling much during COVID, but thank you, mom, for being a loyal uh, watcher. Tim Sohn, Naomi Service, who joined us last week, of course, for uh, the uh, great show with um, uh, Elizabeth Becker. Uh, and just want to give a quick, quick shout out to Naomi. Uh, last Sunday's show, uh, brought back sweet memories of Dith Pran, a New York Times photojournalist and survivor of the Ki Cambodia's killing fields. Um, thank you, Naomi, for join uh, sharing that those wonderful thoughts with us. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on Sri Srinivasan, and we'll uh, start the rest of the show. Good morning, Sri. How are you today? Uh, sorry about that. Good I'm morning. I'm doing great, Neil. Thank you, and thanks for uh, all, all you do to make this show possible. Welcome to everyone who's watching. You're tuning in to the New York Times Read Along. We do this every Sunday. We've been doing this for more than five years. Uh, we are live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So please share on the platform you're watching or tag a friend who can watch live or later. We'll be talking, of course, about all the news that's going on, but we're talking to Ron Lieber today. We'll get a chance to learn about your questions, any you have about your money, as well as about his big new book about paying for college. So get your questions ready, post them, and we'll get to them in the next hour and a half. And we're just so grateful to this wonderful community we've built from people around the world, including Diana, Diane Stefani, who's watching from Margate, New Jersey. She said uh, she was lucky enough to go to uh, City College in the 70s and opened up a world beyond what any Ivy League college could have. Thank you, Diane, for saying that. And James is watching. Looking forward to hearing Ron. Great book. Thanks, says James. And uh, you can uh, see that we're live on LinkedIn as well. And Zeddy's watching over on YouTube in uh, recovering from a second vaccine shot. Great to hear 
uh, hear that. Uh, so welcome also to folks watching on Ron's feed. Thank you, uh, Ron, for letting us be live on your platforms. Uh, welcome to everyone. Let's just uh, do a quick shout out to our fantastic production team. Neil is our executive producer, and we have a great set of folks from various parts of the country with us. Paula Kigers in Tallahassee, Steve DeReeve, Steve Taylor is on uh, with us from Philadelphia, Carla Baranakis, Kabara at Kabara, she's in New Jersey, and Julia Weeks is in Brooklyn, and Neil's down in Washington, D.C. This is an amazing team. When you watch our shows, you know that it's different from what you're used to seeing because each of our members, our team members, is on a different platform annotating and improving the conversation by answering questions and putting in resources. And they're all part of our DigiMentors team. I uh, want to just give a shout out to our uh, amazing colleagues who make this possible. We do summits, conferences, virtual events, hybrid events for folks around the world, including talk shows, training workshops, uh, book launches. If you have any digital help you would like to uh, get, please talk to us. And you can see my email address is right on the screen. We'd love to talk to you. And uh, thank you so much for supporting us. We've done events for 50 people and 100,000 people. We bet your events are somewhere in between. So we'd love to chat about that. Also want to do a big shout out to our sponsors at Muckrack. Please check out the amazing work at Muckrack. Whether you're a journalist, you should get your own confirmed, verified Muckrack account. It's a great digital portfolio. Uh, or you're a PR person who wants to connect with journalists, you'll find their world, world's largest uh, directory of verified journalists very helpful to you. So please check out Muckrack. And if you'd like to be a sponsor, please contact us. You see our contact information. We'd love to get your uh, support of this incredible show. And Neil, thank you for all you do. And I want to just show everyone what we've got in store with the paper, and then we will uh, we will bring on Ron. So here is uh, Ron, Neil. I know you've already previewed the paper on the Twitter feed. So what are some of the things you're excited about talking about today? Absolutely, Shri. Um, I am uh, thrilled. There's there's a lot of really great content in today's paper. Of course, special sections. Uh, there's the cooking, uh, the sheet pan, everything, which is a great wraparound cover. So you have to see the 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 full. Open up the whole thing, that, that huge uh, wraparound cover, which is great. Um, it's only available for subscribers and for people who subscribe to the cooking uh, app. So you'll definitely want to watch uh, our review of the print edition. Uh, there's also um, New York Times for Kids, which uh, I uh, regret, to say, regret to say I did not preview in the Twitter thread, uh, but it's the last Sunday of the month. Again, another print-only special section. Um, which Make, is meet, it says it says meet eighteen kids who are making a difference during the pandemic. Yeah, and it's it's the last Sunday of the month. There's also at the very top of the page, Shri, if you if you find it, it says uh, all, not for adults. Uh, editor's note: um, if you get that, uh, this this section should not be read by grownups. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't don't tell anyone that we're reading it. But uh, shout out to the New York Times uh, magazine staff for all the great work they do. Um, and of course we have the New York Times Magazine that you're pulling up as well. Um, and this is, th this is the age of Ishiguro. This is about the Nobel laureate whose only book I've read is Remains of the Day, but fantastic book. Some of you may have seen the film and he's got a new novel out. So this is about, uh, with his new novel, he reaffirms himself as our most profound observer. So yeah. interesting in terms of taking the, uh, uh, the subheads on the magazine and turning them uh, vertical on that uh, on that cover. So what are the other sections, Shri? Can you show us? Uh, and the Sunday Review, of course. Uh, there's a great op-ed by Teresa Brown, uh, a nurse, talking about the perspective that nurses have, uh, the work that they've been doing over the last year uh, in the review. And so, so important. Uh, we also have the book review, and uh, this is Colonial Ghosts. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm looking for in the book review. There should be uh, the uh, the hard in the hard copy. 
uh, um, Parl uh, uh, Segal did a review of the reviews, um, looking at the 125 year history of the New York Times book for you. So I'm looking to see if it's in uh, this week's hard copy. A really great review. We'll take a look at that. We'll pull it up online if we have to. Um, but always good to take a look at the book review. All right. So let's uh, let's just very quickly look at the front page, and then let's bring on our friend Ron Lieber, who is joining us today. Uh, the, the lead story is Vote Fraud Myth Fuels GOP Drive to Rewrite Laws. And uh, this main feature here, U.S. slow to shield its inmates from virus, how confine home confinement granted rarely even as toll rises, and a second ex-aide alleges Cuomo harassed her. New York's governor asks for inquiry. Stimulus plan faces offers chance to fix the uh, Affordable Care Act and way off Broadway, a preview of its recovery. So this is in Sydney, Australia, and how they're uh, restarting the theater business. And site aims for 12,000 shots a day as supply of vaccine catches up. And um, I am looking forward to getting my first shot in the next couple of months, but still a long way to go for, for most folks. All right, with that, uh, welcome everybody, and let's uh, bring Ron Lieber on. There's Ron. Good morning. Good morning, Ron. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm just tickled to be here, frankly. Uh, I love the Sunday paper. I wish I had more time to read it these days. Um, I, I find it to be a joy and, and a miracle, frankly, as a, as a consumer of news. And, um, you know, when I when I think about retiring someday, uh, one of the things I think about is just the sheer um, joy I will feel being able to read every single word of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and everything I want to read out of the L.A. Times each day. And um, and I'm forgetting uh, there's a, there's another daily newspaper, I think, that I subscribe to or that we subscribe to. Oh, the Washington Post. Right. It's just like I'm going to fill my entire retirement with newspapers, print ones if they still <laughs> exist by then. Um, so the fact that you all do this and that I get to be a part of it is just it's I'm tickled pink. Well, thank you for being here. Our first question always is. How are you doing and how's your family handling the pandemic? You wrote uh, very movingly yes, in yesterday's paper, your column runs on Saturdays, uh, about the passing of your father, where our deepest condolences. Thank you. Wrote, you. Uh, you, you. Even in your grief, you were able to help so many people. That is really your brand, Ron, helping folks. But you, uh, you. obviously, this was a very personal uh, topic. So uh, put this all in context for us, please. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I'm I'm doing pretty badly. Um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the um, the the grief is real, but it's also compartmentalized because my father died um, eight days after my book came out. Uh, and, you know, I prepared for that possibility. Um, but the thing about the book business and, you know, we're, I know we're going to talk about the review and the history of the review. And I can talk about the extremely complex feelings that, that writers have about the review and then that New York Times writers have about being reviewed in the review. Um, but before we even get there, right, um, you know, you don't get a second chance to, to, to launch a book. It's, it, it's actually pretty rare at that even if you try to do it, um, that you're able to. Uh, and so um, I, I, I and, 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 you know, with the, um, in, uh, uh, I guess in um, coordination with my family, made a determination that, well, that we weren't gonna shut it down. I mean, you know, so I'm Jewish, yeah, you, you, you know, you can't shit, um, do what's known as sit Shiva in the way that you once could. You know, Shiva is normally like a, you know, multi-day grieving ritual and you do it at different people's houses and everybody's together and there's a lot of hugging and a lot of eating and like none of that's happening right now. And, you know, you can do Zoom on Shiva, but, you know, I had, uh, you can do uh, Shiva on Zoom, but, you know, I had, uh, you know, four or five book events um, planned over the next uh, next week. And, you know, my father never laid a hand on me. He wasn't that kind of person, but um, he would have kicked my ass, right? If I had shut the, the book launch da down, especially when it was going so well. And moreover, he would have like died twice uh, if it had been, um, 
if, if he could have known or would have known that he caused me to slow down even one bit. He was so proud of this work and he was so proud of the work of my fellow journalists. And he was such an avid reader of the newspaper until he could no longer hold it up anymore. And um, uh, so I've just kept going. Um, and, you know, at some point I'll, I'll probably come apart at the seams, um, but it hasn't happened yet. And I find, you know, the, the art and practice of talking to people and, and helping people and telling them about these, these ideas and, um, you know, bringing them more hope about an extremely complicated, you know, uh, an expensive college process. I, I actually find that, um, I find it personally helpful. Well, thank you for sh mm -hmm. sharing that. And we are lucky that you were able to continue this. And I'm sure he's smiling uh, as he uh, as he thinks about all that you've done. You also made the point that it uh, hit the bestseller list. Uh, just that, what was the sequence after his passing? Yeah, so uh, I found out that he died at um, uh, about 1.30 in the afternoon. And the bestseller list drops it five on Wednesday. So it was the same day. It was three and a half hours later. You know, my my wife came and found me and she told me what had happened. And there was, you know, an hour, an hour and a half of, you know, kind of scramble and, and logistics. Um, and then we went out for a walk in Prospect Park. And um, I, uh, I got the email at five o'clock because I'm on the distribution list, um, you know, for when the list drops at 5 p.m. And I opened it up, and um, I had I'd known that they'd classified my book as um, a, 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 for the advice how to miscellaneous list, which in in many weeks is the hardest list to make because that's where they put all of the you know the cookbooks and the woo woo books and the you know all of that sort of stuff that that used to have the tendency to crowd out serious nonfiction. Um, so they created a separate list for it, um, and it's a very difficult list to make because a lot of those books sell really well. And um, so, you know, I so I like scroll to the bottom of the PDF and I'm looking at the bottom of the list. Right. Because I because I knew that I wasn't going to, you know, knock uh, the fox, the foxhole, the mole and like whatever off the top. I wasn't going to knock the five languages of love off. And and I wasn't there. Right. So it's like, all right. Didn't happen. You know, I've made it before. No big deal. So I keep looking like one slot up and one slot up and one slot up and one slot up. And there I was at number four to my great shock. So, you know, celebration, tears, you know, get the family on FaceTime. It's 30 degrees in Prospect Park. And my wife had brought um, a bottle of Chianti, which was my, which is my dad's favorite wine. So we cracked open the wine in the 30 degree to weather on the Prospect Park loop and we drank a toast to my dad. And, you know, then we planned this cremation. <laughs> Wow. So that was that was my afternoon. I, I cannot imagine that confluence of emotions all happening uh, at the same time. Uh, if you can, we'll talk about the financial aspects of of planning for someone's uh, conditions like that. But what are the headlines for just dealing with this at this particular time? So many people have died uh, where family members have not been able to be with them, not been able to be together. So at this moment of the pandemic, what is what are your headline thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, everybody does it in their own way. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, I want to necessarily give advice about that because it's it's entirely possible that I'm that I'm doing it wrong, right? That I'm not like paying att enough attention to me. Uh, you know, frankly, in this moment, or I'm not paying enough attention to like my emotional needs, you know, I'm, I'm paying, paying ample attention to my work needs. Um, so, um, but what I will say is, um, I, I had sort of um, forgotten or, or, or didn't know, or maybe I just wasn't in the practice of um, doing that on paper. So it turns out condolence cards are still a thing. And every day still like a, another just beautiful card shows up in my mailbox with something that someone has handwritten. And, you know, sometimes it's short, but um, there's one that came yesterday from uh, an old friend who's a book editor. Um, and it was just amazing. Um, I, if I had it here, which I don't, I wouldn't read it to you because I would burst into tears, but um, uh, here's what I would say to people who are helping other people through grief, send that card, <laughs> send the card. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Lots of comments coming in here. 
Jay says, so sorry to hear of your loss of your father. Loss of a parent is something that stays with you for a lifetime. And that's a good thing. We hold them in our hearts and memories. Uh, take care of uh, Stefan. Our friend Stefan says, so sorry for your loss, Ron. May he always rest in peace. Uh, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar writes, and here's, De uh, sorry, she says, my condolences, living and succeeding is the best memorial you can give your father. And uh, we had Debbie Burnick's comment as well. You need virtual bagels and locks for virtual Shiva calls. Uh, our condolences um, as uh, folks. Uh, uh, yes, who, <laughs> also a huge shout out uh, to my friends um, who, um, uh, a whole bunch of my friends from, from the, from freshman year, from my dorm floor, from 1989 at Amherst College, sent a massive box of Russian daughters, including like bagels and locks, and uh, you know, for and, and pickles and babka that lasted a week. So, like, still, still send the food. Definitely, still send the food. <laughs> and well, we have an international audience that may not, everyone may not know Russ and Daughters. So we can tell <laughs> right. them very famous Lower East Side uh, place to get a great Jewish deli. And if you haven't been there, you should go. And I'm glad to hear that they have survived the pandemic. Clearly. Uh, and Stephanie says, I'm so freaking proud of my brother, Ron. So welcome, Stephanie. I'm proud of you, too. <laughs> you, tell us about Stephanie. Where to start? Um, I just you're just going to make me cry the whole time. Is that what this is going to be? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, so my sister runs um, a nonprofit in Chicago called Immerman Angels. And um, this is another thing you can do for somebody um, who's in a tight spot right now um, because people are still getting diagnosed with cancer left and right, even as people are dying of COVID and getting sick from COVID uh, left and right. Um, and uh, Immerman or uh, Angels will, will basically match you up with a, um, you know, artisanally selected cancer friend. So like if you are a dad um you know in the midwest with like stage four pancreatic cancer they'll like hook you up with a dad from the midwest who survived stage four pancreatic cancer um and and that and that dude will will you know essentially like hold your hand um and walk you through the process and um they can do it for you know more or less uh, anyone um with any kind of cancer and um and that is her gig. And she lives in Chicago, uh, about five blocks from where we grew up. Um, we grew up five blocks east of Wrigley Field. So uh, um, that is my sister. Awesome. And we put showing on screen the Immerman Angels so that people can uh, see that. So thank you, Stephanie, for uh, watching with us. And so many great comments coming in from folks all over the world. Ron Thomas is watching in... Uh, Dubai and says, I live by the mantras, always trying to make both my parents proud. Thank you, Ron, for sharing that. Sujana says, we lost my father-in-law on 119. Your words resonate so deeply. And uh, lots of other comments. Mindy says, cannot have a Shiva without Bhakta. <laughs> Again, we have an international audience. We should remind folks if you say what, don't know what that is. Talk about uh, Bhakta is. Yeah. Yeah, what Bhakta is and also remind folks what Shiva is because to many people who are watching, Shiva has a different connotation. Uh, right. Yes. Thank you. So Shiva, um, Shiva is a Jewish morning ritual where, for a number of of nights, uh, generally after sundown, um, you know, each and every um, evening after a loved one's death, um, you gather together in a home and and you say a, you know a certain set of prayers, right, in in, in the same order. Um, and sometimes it's lay led, sometimes, um, you know, a, a rabbi or a cantor is there, um, you know, and it's an opportunity in effect, you know, for people to receive visitors. It's it's a Jewish wake without the body um, with, with some, some, some ritual and some liturgy. And, you know, it, it is um, often, although not always and not for everyone, um, uh, an incredibly comforting ritual. And, um, you know, some people have found uh, shivas on Zoom to be comforting in their own way. Um, I, you know, um, you know, it wasn't something that we ended up doing. We did do like a private family, um, you know, form of shiva uh, on one night with our rabbi and our cantor, uh, which, which was helpful. Um, 
And then uh, traditionally shivas have just like enormous tables filled with way too much food. And often it is of the bagels and lox and sweet pastry variety. Um, and babka is uh, I, I, originally, I think of Eastern European origin, but it is a pastry where um, you, you, you take a pastry dough and the like, you know, modern bakers have 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 done it like with a brioche bow dough or like a, a, a butter based dough, which makes it super decadent. Um, but it's generally uh, more like a challah dough or it's, it's you know, kind of um, eggy, you know, kind of yellow from the egg yolk. And you spread, you spread it out in a very, very thin layer. And then you effectively like paint or sprinkle chocolate depending on the, um, uh, on, on the technique that's being used, or sometimes cinnamon, or some, now, nowadays more exotic things, but usually chocolate or cinnamon, like all over the thin layers. And then you like roll them up and fold them until it's a, it's a loaf, um, you know, with like 30 or 50 or 20 or 17, you know, thin layers of dough and chocolate and dough and chocolate and dough and chocolate and dough and chocolate. And, dough and, chocolate. Um, and then you slice it as if it was, um, uh, you know, like uh, like a meatloaf, essentially, or like a pumpkin loaf. Um, and that's babka. Wow, that's a very detailed explanation. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure people who are not eating that right now are wishing there were lots of great comments coming in here. And Lauren Young says, you're from a long line of mentions, uh, Rahan. It shows sending you love and light and so many hugs. Um, and, and Paula and others have been sharing links to the Immerman Angels. And folks have been... Uh, saying uh, thank you for that. Um, and here's Ellen saying how incredible Immerman Angels, extraordinary. And Sandra Yin is going to share info about the angels. So uh, that's uh, that's great. And Lauren says you also uh, should check out Shelsky's <laughs> of Brooklyn, a appetizing and, uh, yes. and, and a deli. So, yeah. yeah, sure. Shout out to Peter Shelsky. Um, Peter, Peter did our daughter's bat mitzvah. Um, um, you know, essentially what Peter realized was that um, Russ and Daughters need not be the only place in New York with, you know, high quality, what's known as Jewish appetizing, right? The bagels and lox and the more exotic smoked fish. Um, and so Peter started his own thing in Brooklyn and uh, uh, it's incredibly high quality stuff. So, um, uh, but my, my, my former dorm mates from James Hall uh, at Amherst College, uh, you know, they they knew uh, they knew Russ and Daughters. Russ and Daughters is nationally and internationally renowned. Um, Peter is more of a local hero at this point, but probably deserves to be a national one. And makes sense that Brooklyn would have a strong competitor in that field. So that's indeed that's great, indeed. Patricia. Uh, Ron, uh, Debbie says you have a future as a food and baking columnist. And Patricia writes, uh, Ron is remarkable to have strength to push through this difficult time. And Patricia says she's inspired. So that's great. And Macron says that Seinfeld first introduced us. To oh, that's Dr. right. <laughs> oh, right. That crazy Seinfeld episode. It's true. And the marble ride. Uh -huh. that's, that's, yeah. That's, that's, um, uh, and, and for people who are interested in babka, um, you, you can order babka on, on Gold Belly. Um, I can't remember which purveyor they use, but the, the VP of uh, business development, uh, essentially one of the chief um, product testers for Gold Belly, just moved into my building and we get some of his like sloppy seconds and leftover thirds. And I know that they've got at least one babka there that you can order very easily uh, online if you want to check it out for yourself. One day I'm going to learn to bake it, speaking of being a baking columnist, um, and I will pat myself on the back for the fact that, um, you know, I'm one of these people at the Times who has tried and is going to continue to try to write for every section of the paper before I die uh, or before I'm carried out of there or, or shoved. Um, and I, I have um, con uh, uh, contributed to, to the dining section more than once, including uh, a cover piece that I'm very proud of a couple of years ago about the um, uh, uh, the Jewish tradition of Mamuna. Um, M-I-M-O-U-N-A is how I think we settled on the spelling, um, which is uh, essentially a big carb laden feast um, that uh, Moroccans uh, and, and Sephardic Jews do at the end of Passover, uh, which reminds me that we are uh, less than, we're about a month away from the next Mamuna. So I got to get ready. And here's Gold Belly and a picture of the babka. And oh, there's multiple Miriam. babkas. What have we got here? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so let's talk about all this. All right. So, um, all right. So I like the oneg babka. The, the the that's the one in like many multi layers. I'm pretty sure that comes from a um, uh, an Orthodox bakery 
in Williamsburg. Bread's Bakery is what I was talking about, the kind of more modern babka that's made with a, more of a buttery dough. It is absolutely incredible. And they make one, I'm pretty sure, with Nutella or some kind of hazelnut that'll just blow your mind. Um, uh, I, I, there's much that I love about Russ and Daughters, and I do like their babka. Um, I'm not sure this, this, this may be controversial. I'm not sure the Russ and Daughters babka is the best babka in New York City. What else do we have here? <laughs> Anything else? Are there additional choices? Uh, there, there probably the are, but we need to move on to the Bob <laughs> here at All some right. point. I do want to say that Miriam Berkeley, who's you know lived in New York for so many years, wonderful photographer here. Uh, she she posts, I've eaten babka numerous times, but never knew how it is made. Thank you so much for the information and yeah. condolences. This is uh, so you. many different things that we're talking about here and. Uh, Ron just said that he has written for several sections, and but he hasn't had a recipe of his own yet in the New York Times, so he's going to work on that in the baking uh, section, I presume, over time. Uh, folks, if you're just joining us, this is Ron Lieber. We are delighted to have him with us. He's the Your Money columnist in the New York Times, someone I read religiously because uh, as, a, as a, a parent, we need to keep track of our money. And uh, he's also got a big new book out, which is in the uh, behind, over his shoulder. I don't know if he has a copy right in front of him so he can hold that up as well. And here it is, the price you pay for college, an entirely new roadmap for the biggest financial decision your family will ever make. And uh, this is that instant New York Times bestseller. And we'll ask him questions about it. Uh, just before that, over his shoulder also is a sign that we can't quite read about Room Raider. So, uh, for folks who aren't familiar with it, Room Raider is uh, a Twitter website that, uh, uh, a Twitter feed that rates people's appearance on Zoom calls, uh, shows like ours, MSNBC, CNN. And it says there, Room Raider is classist. Tell us about that. I, I just don't know why why we're judging people during a pandemic. It, it, it feels kind of mean to me. Um, I, you know, my, my apologies to people who, you know, enjoy it and, and find it fun. And I cast no aspersions, uh, you know, on anybody who's worked their background to try and, you know, get a 10 out of 10. But um, uh, I'm a pretty lucky guy financially. You know, I'm a pretty affluent dude. Um, and like, I don't have space in my New York City apartment to make it look all pretty and keep it clean. I'm busy. I'm doing like two to three times as much work as I was before the pandemic started. I've got kids. I can't keep things clean. I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have, you know, a tiny separate space uh, away from my apartment. Uh, you know, again, like, uh, you know, incredibly lucky financially and logistically to be able to have that and find it. But like, I, I'm not going to turn the, the the screen here, but it's like crammed and crazy and filled <laughs> with like a whole bunch of, 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 of like flotsam from our family's life. And like, I don't want to be rated. I, I don't want, I mean, I understand the Twitter's for meanness, right? Like that's why it was made and that's that's what it is in, in many respects. Um, but you know, leave me alone, leave me alone. All right, uh, thank you, Ron. Uh, standing up for folks who have been browbeaten by all the good backgrounds that people have. As you can see, my background is nothing to uh, to to talk about right now. In fact, when, when you fill the screen, I get worried and I'm hoping my wife Rupa isn't watching. Uh, folks, thank you so much for being here. We're going to be reading the print paper of the New York Times with Ron, but we of course want to uh, get some headlines about the book and what people should know. Uh, for, for folks who haven't been paying attention to the price of college, the fact that you know people buy homes and cars and everything else, you're saying this is the most important uh, financial decision families will make. So talk us through that, please. Sure. Um, I started thinking about this, obviously, uh, you know, when, well, I mean, I started thinking about this in 1988 uh, when I needed financial aid, uh, when my, when I was applying to college and my family didn't have enough money for the schools that I wanted to go to. Uh, I learned a lot about the process um, at that point, um, in part because we we lucked into a relationship with uh, the assistant director of financial aid at Northwestern University, you know, about 10 miles from where I grew up, who was running this crazy side hustle where he was taking cash on 
the barrel and essentially telling people all the secrets of the financial aid system as long as they weren't applied to Northwestern. And so we got all this great advice and um, I got a really good financial aid package uh, at Amherst College and got my debt, pay debt paid back in 10 years without too much trouble. And um, and that stuck with me, right? That there were these complex systems involving money, that somewhere out there was a grown up who knew how to beat the system legally and was generous with their relatively generous with their time. And so, I mean, is it any wonder that, you know, 10 or 12 years later, I finally figured out that what I was really put on the earth to do journalistically was to be the person whose beat is beating the system, right? That is actually not a surprise at all, right? So I figured that out. Then I become a parent um, of a now 15 year old and also a, a five year old who came along later, um, you know, became obsessed like a good little personal finance boy. You know, I came up, became obsessed with saving for college and doing that right, became obsessed with paying for college and not doing that wrong. Journalistically, I spilled a lot of ink in the last decade plus now about borrowing, about the student loan system, about some of the extremely problematic, um, uh, you know, uh, issues with it. Um, but then my email started to fill up with notes from readers um, who were in at least three different predicaments. There were the people who, um, you know, earned one hundred fifty, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, super lucky people, great living, and they had just somehow assumed that financial aid would be coming their way, given that flagship state universities now cost one hundred thousand dollars for four years without a discount, and and many of the same privates that those folks had had gone to um, were over three hundred thousand dollars. So they just kind of assumed they had it coming because these prices were so high. And they didn't. And they got to the end of the senior year and they had sort of blithely made promises to their kids or assurances that it would all be OK. And then they were in a pickle and they were literally crying, you know, into my inbox um, or, or into my mobile phone if they knew how to find me. And it was too late for me to help them. Um, then there were a bunch of people who um, were just sort of innocently approaching the system, um, not having realized that an entire like separate um, train track of discounting had hived off from the need-based system that I and others in the 80s and early 90s had, had operated in. Um, this is known as merit aid, which is a, a different form of discounting that has nothing to do with how much money you have or how much money you earn and kind of everything to do with how your kid is done or, or, or who you are. And people were getting these merit aid offers or hearing about it way too late and not realizing that they could build a sort of strategic application and college shopping process around this new system. <clears throat> and again, it was too late to help them. And then there were the people that understood how things had changed and how things worked, um, but they were coming to me with a different question. They were like, Ron, the New York Times does not shut up, and the business section in particular does not shut up about how much uh, we live now in the world of big data. So where is the big data set that can explain to me why Cornell at full price is, is worth $300,000 and that it's $100,000 better, better than Kenyon College in Ohio or Occidental College in California, um, you know, discounted, uh, you know, by $20,000 a year, you know, with this merit aid, right, to $200,000. So why is Cornell $100,000 better than Kenyon exactly? And why is Cornell $200,000 better than SUNY Bing Binghamton, Rutgers, you know, UC Davis, UGA, USC, name your favorite state school, right? Like, tell me again where the big data set is that explains that to me. And I thought, huh, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know the answer to your question. Um, and moreover, there are not a lot of new questions in the world of personal finance. I do a reasonably good job of making people think that I'm writing about it differently from week to week or month to month. But I mean, let's be honest, like if you go back and look at all of the times and it may be double digits now in the last 12 years that I've told people like not to panic when the, the stock market is you know freaking out or, or, or dropping, um, you know, the, those those columns aren't all that different from one another at the end of the day. You know, hopefully I've gotten better at conveying my thoughts, but this, this was a new question, right? They were not asking about what to save for college. They were not asking about how to pay for college. They were asking what to pay for college, right? They were asking a value question 
Um, and a value question is only one letter short of a values question. And when we're in the run realm of like money and values, then, then we're in my territory. And I knew there was no way to answer that question in one com or five or 10, and I was off and running. So let's talk about different uh, stages of uh, where your kid might be. So we have a question here from Stefan, whose uh, son is just starting high school. What is the number one thing to do or to never do? You can pick if you want to do it as a do's or don'ts uh, for that age group, and then we'll we'll go up the ladder. So, uh, uh, you know, young kids. So let's do before we do high school. Maybe when kids are in middle school, how much? What should you be doing? What are the good things to do? Well, I, you know, I think um, when when your kids are young, the you know one of the things that you can do if if it's possible, right, is to save as much money as you reasonably can. Um, and, uh, not everybody is going to, um, you know, be able to save, uh, uh, enough in like one fell swoop or in, in monthly nuggets over the course of 18 years to pay for what today is a $300,000 school, um, you know, out of savings. Like that's not going to be a realistic goal for most people, but you save as much as you can. The more that you can save, um, the easier the choices will be later. And you pat yourself on the back for having, you know, set some good habits and doing something good for your kid or for your kids. So, you know, it sort of starts there. Um, I also think at the beginning, it's very important to sit down with your spouse if you have one um, or your ex if you have one of those uh, to make sure you're on the same page um, or yourself if you're parenting solo. And, you know, tell yourself some stories about how you experienced college yourself in the process of paying for it or, or paying the debt back. Um, if you were in that spot, um, and if you went to college, uh, and um, think about um, what you did right, what you did wrong, and most importantly, how you think you would like it to be different for your kids. Because if you've got really strong feelings or a strong memory, um, whether it's extremely positive or extremely negative about how college or the process of you know navigating it changed your life or or made your life complicated or difficult. Um, then that may be part and parcel of the financial goal that you're going to be setting for yourself. Um, you know, I or we are going to pay everything, no debt for our kids, no matter what, right? Um, or I took on way too much debt and um, we are just going to make it clear to our kid, you know, from day one, uh, that there is not going to be any school that costs more than $100,000 in today's dollars or, or whatever it is. You know, I make no judgments about the goal you set, I only make judgments about not setting the goal. Um, and then in middle school, uh, you know, you sort of need to start um, start anew with the with the conversations with your spouse or your ex or yourself, um, and just think about, all right, well, you know, what what sort of trajectory financially do I or we seem to be on? Like, what do we think we might be able to pay? What do I think I might be willing to pay? Is there a gulf between those two numbers and um, between the cost of some schools that might be appealing? Uh, if so, am I comfortable with that or can I live with it? And then how am I going to begin to explain it and kind of set expectations um, with my child? So we, we have Neil who's asking about his seven-year-old and how he should be planning. And of course, we're going up that that, that ladder of uh, school. Uh, Eric Husseldahl, who uh, has a young child, says, care to explain what a 529 plan is and what the advantages are? Uh, keep in mind that we do have an international audience that is interested in American schools, colleges, a lot of mm -hmm. people send their kids uh, here, but they may not have access to something like a 529 plan. Sure, so it's a, fi a 529 plan is um, something that I believe only American citizens can use. Um, I am reasonably sure that you can save in one if you're a citizen uh, living outside of the United States. Um, but it gets a little complicated because there, there are some benefits in some instances, tax benefits uh, on the way in when you deposit your money and invest it um, that accrue to people who live in certain states. So that's something that you need to check for yourself. But generally, 529 plans are specialized um, savings accounts and investment vehicles. And, you know, because America, uh, this has to be extremely complicated, right? I mean, God forbid we should have like a single college savings 
plan that everyone can use anywhere where the rules are all the same. No, of course not. We've got different ones in different states. Almost every state has at least one. Some of them have two or even three, but the basics are this, right? Um, you set up an account. It's kind of like um, our retirement accounts here in the States, like a 401k or a 403b. There's a list of investments. You pick one. Um, you can select a, a, a mutual fund, right? A collection of, of stocks that, um, you know, pretty aggressive when the kid is young and then it gets less aggressive as the kid gets closer to 18. You can just put the money in there, set it and forget it. So two benefits to these accounts, um, both related to taxes. First of all, in 30 some states where these benefits exist, when you put the money in, you get some kind of tax break related to your state income taxes. And it's different in nearly all of the states that offer the break. So you've got to look up what the deal is in your state and you probably have to invest in your state's plan to get the break. That's generally the way that it works. Then when your kid goes to college and hopefully the money has grown a bunch, right? You take all of the money out, you've got to spend it on educational expenses, otherwise you pay a penalty and, and some extra taxes. But when you take that money, you spend it on educational expenses, you don't pay any taxes on the growth. So you otherwise would have paid a whole bunch of capital gains, right? No capital gains. So you know if you start early and you stay consistent, there's an opportunity for you know, 20, $25,000 in tax savings um, just on the growth alone. So in theory, that's the beauty of it. Now, even talking about this is a privilege, right? I mean, there's all sorts of people who are paying their own student loans back when their first kid goes to college, right? And maybe they have experienced job loss, so they're taking care of an aging parent, or, um, or you know, they've just lost income. Um, you know, you're a sales representative for a hotel chain. I mean, imagine what's happened to the variable compensation for those folks right now, right? I mean, it's just, it's a bloodbath, right? So like, who has the ability to save, let alone for $100,000, $300,000? I get it, right? No judgments if you can't do it. Um, but save as much as you reasonably can. Um, try and start early. The earlier you start, the more you'll benefit um, you know, from growth over time and compound interest and, and, and that tax break. So, so we're talking, folks, uh, this is Ron Lieber, and we're talking about saving for college. So we talked about middle school and then by high school towards 11th, 12th grade, uh, what should you be doing? Well, um, when your child starts high school, that to me is about the time to have a conversation about what um, you alone or the two of you, if there's two parents in the mix or more, uh, you know, step parents are involved too. Um, that's about the time to, to sit down and, and tell your kid you know, what, what you think um, that you'll be able to pay, what you think that they'll, uh, you'll be willing to pay. Um, and so as they begin to kind of marinate in high school in this, you know, discussion of, of you know, college shopping and the college decision out on the horizon, which really ought to be an opportunity for hope and optimism and excitement and, and uplift, um, that there's not, you know, disappointment drop in there unexpectedly about what you are able and willing to pay. And moreover, I do think we owe kids an explanation of how the system works. Um, it is true um, that good grades will be worth discounts and sometimes bigger ones at certain schools under many circumstances. And if we deliberately hide that information from kids because we think it will harm them or we think we can't they can't handle it, I understand the decision not to put um, extra pressure on kids who may already feel it in, in many communities. Um, but the alternative is to deliberately hide important and vital information from them. And when they find out that we did that, they're probably going to be really mad and, and, and disappointed, right? And, and also, we can't keep this from them. Um, they're going to hear about it from older siblings. They're going to hear about it from older friends. It's one Google away. When they take the PSAT, they're going to be bar bombarded with financial come-ons um, you know, from companies who buy their data. Um, and so I, I think we got to let them know before they start that this is how it goes. And then there are folks who are in college decisions right now, including my family. I have twins who are 17 and a half. Uh, they're, they're looking at uh, colleges right now. They're in you know, high school seniors. They're, they're gonna have to decide where to go, 
what can they do at this point to improve their chances of getting aid, things like that? And where does the early decision process fit into this? It feels to me like colleges know that you're an early decision kid, you mean you're gonna go there, so they don't really have to give you any merit paid. Yeah, so um, speaking of things that are classist, uh, early decision is classist. Um, uh, you know, the people who benefit most from it are the people with, um, you know, no financial uncertainty. Um, so if you're rich, uh, or if you saved a lot, and you can afford to pay in full, um, then that admissions advantage, the, the improved odds accrue to you during the early decision process, um, because your odds of getting in are better. And um, it's certainly useful for the institutions because they can lock in a, a high percentage of their class with a whole bunch of people paying in full uh, and feel really good about the trajectory they're on for that year's class financially. So I understand why the institutions do it. Um, but if you are a family where money is not no object, you are in theory committing to uh, attend the school, no matter what kind of offer they make you. Now it starts to get complicated and granular in here because some institutions are need blind and they need full need and they all put a net price calculator, uh, what's known as a net price calculator on their website. So you can predict with a certain amount of, of reasonable accuracy, what kind of need-based aid you might get offered. But if you are a family that um, you know, earns $200,000, $250,000 a year, not going to qualify for need-based aid, applying to a relatively selective school um, that does offer merit aid, where the odds are going to be better early decision, and the school does not offer any ability to predict what kind of merit aid discount you might get, um, you're in a real pickle if you apply for financial aid, if you apply for early decision. Because if you were the admissions officer, I mean, what would you do? Would you use your merit aid money? Would you use that discount on a family that's raised their hand and said, I'm coming no matter what? Probably not, or probably right. not as much of it, right? You save, sure. your, you save your powder uh, for the end of the process. So those families are disadvantaged. Low-income families are certainly disadvantaged uh, at schools that may not meet full need or may give you a, a, a package that's you know filled with more loans than you feel like you can handle as a low-income individual. So yeah. Um, the system's classist. I encourage people to break their early decision commitment um, in certain instances, uh, you know, if the money is not there. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is the schools will allow that. So, um, I, I, you know, I guess my bottom line is that early decision is not, in fact, binding uh, if you are in a financial predicament and you don't get uh, the amount that you think that you need. You should feel free to walk away. So that's kind of a big headline there. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of folks may have had their circumstances change over this year. And that so if you, if you got in in November, December, and you're looking at now the next four years and you feel like you need to change that, you're saying that that's okay. I didn't realize that you could, in fact, get out of it. So, I, so I've, I've, I've run laps around the country the last five years, and I've asked this question everywhere I go. Um, especially because, because I, you know, college counselors get really upset when I say this. And so I, I very deliberately went to all of these heads of admissions and enrollment management and financial aid. And I said, are you going to penalize a school and the kids who come along next year and the year after that, if a kid in a previous year has broken their early decision commitment because of money? And they looked at me like I was from outer space. They said, I, I, just, I don't know where these college counselors get this idea, but like, we need students and we, we can't afford for half of Long Island to think that like Syracuse is punishing a whole bunch of towns and high schools because somebody changed their mind about early decision. That That's not how it works here. Like this is a competitive market. We're not gonna penalize some innocent family because somebody in a previous year, you know, decided that they couldn't afford the offer we made them. That's nuts. Um, and if there's anybody out there who can prove that I'm wrong, um, uh, you know, I, I continue to ask in public, um, for stories of institutions that have held um, somebody walking away from an early decision commitment against the next year's class. If that's ever happened, I want to know about it because I'm going to out that school and I'm going to do it in the New York Times. So come find me if you can prove that that's happened, uh, but only if you're willing to go on the record with a name. 
um, because we can't be, you know, cowardly about calling these institutions out. Um, Anyway, so you lost me on a little bit of a rant there, but just another 30 seconds on a related matter, which is that for people who are in the spot now in March and April, and they don't like the the discount offers that they're getting, go back and ask for more. And if it's a need-based aid offer, um, go to the financial aid office and say, our family has had a change in financial circumstances and here, let us prove it to you, right? Here are the receipts, right? Here's the layoff notice, the unemployment check, the nursing home bill, whatever it is that's happened to you all um, and your family, go ahead and prove it. On the merit aid side, go to the admissions office, hopefully with a, um, a lower net price from a competing institution, go in with great humility and say, hey, um, would like to come here. Uh, this other place that's like the second or third choice that I know you compete for students with, we got a lower net price offer there. And we're worried that we did, we were worried that we did something wrong in our application to you. And we'd like to take an opportunity to correct it here. And oh, by the way, would you like to hear about the incredible things that, you know, son or daughter has done in the last three or four months that might make you even more excited, not just to have them, but to maybe meet us halfway or even a little bit more. Um, That conversation that I've coached people through regularly yields five figures of money in the space of approximately five minutes. Wow, so that's that's very helpful. Go get it, go do it. (laughs) Patricia says, Ron, you rock. I love the challenge for financial rights. Your friend Lauren says, I'm in the throes of looking at colleges. How much should we involve Leo in terms of paying for it? What should I tell him? His 529 has done really well, thankfully. Uh, I think you should tell him that last part, Lauren. Um, You should um, be proud of yourself uh, for having pulled that off, um, you know, amid everything else, right, that's uh, that's gone on uh, in your life and everyone's life these last 15 or 20 years. Um, uh, You should have every, um, you should feel no guilt whatsoever if your ability to pay um, does not match your willingness to pay certain institutions that he might be interested in um, that you may, where you might not feel the value is there, you know, have those conversations sooner rather than later, um, you know, and then you can get like super aggressive about involving him in paying for it if you so choose, right? Um, uh, there um, there were a, um, uh, a, a couple of, of folks at the times, parents married to one another, um, neither of them are there anymore. Um, but I wrote about them in my last book, The Opposite of Spoiled. Um, and they made the determination that uh, each of their four kids was going to pay a semester of tuition out of pocket, even if they went to you know an expensive uh, you know private university, which I think at least three of the four of them did. And they were informed of this fact, you know, around about seventh grade. Um, and they scrubbed toilets at the beach and scooped ice cream and, you know, worked 60 hours a week during the summer and a little bit during the school year. And eventually they all became lifeguards and, you know, earned that good, um, public beach lifeguard salary and they all did it. And, you know, some of them spent, uh, I think over $20,000, um, out of their savings. So you can do this. Yes, guilt. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, Lauren, though. But chapter whatever it is, I think it's like chapter nine of the price you pay for college is about guilt. There's a whole chapter. There's a whole chapter on guilt. And yes, I excerpted it. Thank you for reminding me. I excerpted the guilt um, question, uh, the guilt chapter in uh, Well Family. Um, thank you to Roberta Zeff uh, and, and the crew there for publishing that piece. Uh, I'm trying to bring people back from their guilt trips. There are so many itineraries you can write for yourself. Um, to go on these guilt trips and just stop it. Uh, you have done the best that you can. Uh, you should pat yourself on the back. And now, um, y- you know, with with my help now, you know, you're going to go forth um, and do this right and, and have a sane process that ends in happiness and hopefully not uh, a, a large pile of debt. Thank you. So this is so helpful for parents who are watching right now. And I'm going to make sure my twins also watch uh, when they when they can. Here, if, folks, if you're just tuning in, this is the Sunday New York Times read along. Ron Lieber's our guest. He is the author of The Price You Pay for College and the Your Money columnist at the New York Times. Please uh, check out his book, which you should absolutely get for yourself. Or if you have nieces, nephews, grandparents, kids, etc., they should, folks should be reading this book. And we read the New York Times out loud every Sunday. 
and we do this at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. And this, if you missed the rest of this conversation before up to now, it'll rerun immediately as soon as we're off the air on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. If you have uh, folks uh, who could benefit from this, please tag them right now. Please text them, WhatsApp them, or just tell them to tune in now or later. And here's a little bit about the book, an entirely new roadmap for the biggest financial decision your family will ever make. And that's, uh, Ron, on that cover, you've got uh, dollar bills or lots of dollars uh, made into a diploma. Talk about the production of the cover. Yeah, so um, the thing that was, uh, um, the thing that was, um, that was tricky about this, uh, wasn't so much the image um, that that image came to the designer pretty quickly. Um, uh, the thing that was actually difficult was the title. Um, for a long time, the working title was "What to Pay for College." You know, I like gave you that kind of quasi soliloquy before about you know it's not how to save and it's not how to pay; it's what to pay. Right, so for a long time we were calling this "What to Pay for College," and Harper, my publisher, um, thought it was boring, um, and uh, I, I thought it was, you know, I, I, I thought it, I thought it was right on the nose, but maybe it was too on the nose. And so, you know, I tried to take them seriously. I believe in good editing, trying to satisfy your your editors, um, and I just could not crack it. And you know, I'm part of a nonfiction book writers group, and and they couldn't crack it. Um, you know, my best, most talented friends couldn't crack it. Um, and then uh, I was listening to Springsteen one day, Bruce Springsteen, and um, his song, The Price You Pay, came on. And I was like, you idiot. This is the answer. This is the answer. The book is should, the book's going to be called The Price You Pay for College. And as soon as I sent it to everybody at Harper, there was like glee and hysteria. Um, so thank you, Bruce Springsteen. All right, uh, folks, uh, we just want to, before we get into the paper, we have about half an hour left. We have a lot of, of the paper to cover, but we do want to tell you what's coming up in the uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, today is Ron Lieber, March 7th. Next Sunday is Cheryl McCarthy, host of City University's one-to-one -one interview show, and she's a former uh, journalist at the Baltimore Evening Sun, Newsday, and the New York Daily News. And then Ralph Blumenthal will be with us the week after, a longtime New York Times reporter, as you can see there, and the author of The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack. So please do tune in every Sunday. We have fabulous guests like Ron who help us uh, understand the world that's unfolding in the newspaper with us. So Ron, let's uh, talk about the, the paper here. And uh, let me just put on the screen, uh, first your thoughts on this array of print that's still going strong. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, look, at, look at how beautiful it is. It's so beautiful. I, I haven't seen it splayed like that in a while. And I, I know that it's been like, you know, 20 some years since we got color, but just look at how gorgeous that is. Right. I, 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 I mean, look, I, I, I can't be, um, I can't be neutral about this, but I, long before I was at the times, I felt like what would, whatever, whatever it was then $5, I think it's more like $10 now that $5 it, you know that you that you spend on the Sunday paper is like is like the best value in content. Is it only six dollars still? Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's just an incredible value. That's an incredible value. Look at that. I mean, I want to read everything. I you know I have a I have more eclectic interests than than most people, but um, I you know it's just beautiful. And uh, is sheet pan even there? I don't think we were even looking at sheet pan. Oh, there's sheet pan. Yeah. So the sheet pan. How awesome is that? Yeah. You're yeah, going to so, cook for months out of that freaking thing. So Go what buy this is, we just want to tell everybody, this is 20 often surprising, always delicious recipes for the most versatile pan in your kitchen. And uh, so they've got lots of recipes here that you can, you can do one sheet, I guess, is the idea of this. The last thing I want to do at home is use all these pots and pans. Uh, the other day I noticed in one day we used six pans. So one <laughs> sheet sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I am just so um, proud of this group of Sam and Emily and Kim 
and Julia uh, and uh, Patrick and all of these folks who are doing such incredible work. Um, you know, it, it took us as an institution way too long to um, stand up in public and say, we're gonna own the recipe space. You know, we let a lot of really crappy websites uh, kind of get out in front of us for five or 10 or 15 years, but now we're doing it. We're making it good enough to pay for. I think people should pay for it. Even if they don't want the Times generally, you can get New York Times cooking on its own if that's your jam. Um, and there are probably 172 jam recipes uh, in NY Times <laughs> cooking. Um, and um, that group is growing, right? Journalism organizations that are hiring and growing are rare. And that, that's happening because it's good, because it is really freaking good. It is useful. Um, it improves your life, right? And um, just stepping back, the amount of pride I, I have um, in the institution um, for, for you know, stepping forward and upping its game substantially on service journalism generally is just, it, it, it feels so good as somebody who has devoted my career to it and hasn't always thought that um, journalism especially, but, but also the Times has, you know, taken it seriously enough kind of as, a, um, as an art and as a science um, and making it worth paying for. And so I, it's just thrilling to see. Well, they've- Okay, I haven't seen this snitch story yet. What's this about? After a year of coronavirus lockdowns and political turmoil, Americans are regarding one another verily, warily and engaging in an age-old tactic for keeping rule breakers in check, tattling. And uh, to bring that back to your expertise, uh, certainly that college scandal of last year involved somebody tattling and snitching, didn't it? Yeah, well, I, and my recollection is that the, the way that ultimately came down was that... Um, uh, somebody snitched because um, they were in a different sort of trouble, and they and they 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 told out um, Singer, the uh, the college counselor. They they told him out um, to try and keep themselves out of jail so that they could, I think, be a cooperating witness. And um, you know, if you're ever going to have a Wall Street Journal reporter on this New York Times show. Um, have Melissa Korn and um, Jennifer Levitz, who wrote this incredible book called Unacceptable uh, about the scandal, um, and they can tell you more. But the, the irony there, um, Sri, is that I'm pretty sure there was a snitcher, um, more than one, actually. There were some college counselors who thought that there's some really weird stuff going on and tried to snitch and couldn't get anybody to take them seriously. Um, you know, so, so I, I mean, this word snitch, right? It, it, it's, it's a pejorative. It has a negative connotation. But um, I, I like to think of snitchers maybe more like whistleblowers, uh, like that, um, that aide who came forward to talk about Governor Cuomo. I think whistleblower is a better, a better term. By the mm -hmm. way, I've been, uh, this is from uh, This Day in History, February 28, 1933. I've been so worried about the last five years of the, you know, in, in 2016, I, I, I was quoted saying that this was like Berlin in 32, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or 1930. And here here we are. I think we escaped in January from from this. But as we know, what mm -hmm. happened in Germany is that the first time the coup failed and then the 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 everything that happened since. So there's a good reminder that the fire at the Reichstag was this day in history. And all these little items here, including when to replace your gadgets, just a quick comment about service journalism. I think in some circles in journalism that is used as a pejorative. And you as someone who's doing service journalism, me as a tech reporter who does a lot of that, uh, how do you think that's changed over your lifetime? Well, um, it, it, it's changed a lot. Um, you know, I, I remember feeling kind of sheepish about it. Um, in 1998 when I made a pivot because uh, I'd come to New York in 1994 uh, to take a job as a reporter at Fortune magazine. Um, Fortune was about to undergo an incredible renaissance. The economy was about to take off. Um, there was a boom in hiring at the entry level there. Uh, it was in the storied Time Inc. building, you know, kind of the last good days of Time Inc. Uh, before things began to um, kind of circle the drain. And it was an incredible opportunity. I learned so much, 
But what I realized there was that the thing that I loved the most about journalism, and it was something that I was finding out in the books that I was writing on the side and, and a little bit for Fortune too, was that what I enjoyed most was being of service. I wanted people to take my stories and put them to work. I wanted to be rippable, outable, and I wanted to be useful. And that was not what Fortune uh, was interested in or what its like primary purpose was at the time. And discovering that and discovering that, you know, my passion was not ultimately all that valued there was painful. But at the same time, this com this magazine called Fast Company was coming out of the gate. And the, the tagline of Fast Company was literally put it to work, right? So I pulled the ripcord and, and took a risk and, and went to work for Fast Company to do business ser service journalism. Um, and then, uh, you know, in 2003, 2002, when the Wall Street Journal was starting the personal journal section, the journal, to its great and enduring credit, saw and recognized that service journalism was so valuable that you could build an entire news section around it and put it in the newspaper three days a week. And so I went to work on the launch team there. And it was Edward Felsenthal and Eben Shapiro, two editors there who are now running Time magazine who saw something in me that I had not really articulated for myself, which was that my beat was beating the system and that that too was personal finance. And as soon as we figured that out, I knew that that was my life's work. That's, that's amazing. So two things I want to just call out. You said, uh, you know, beating the system is your beat and mm -hmm. that you want your content to be rip outable so that mm -hmm. people could rip it out and stick it on their fridge or save save it somewhere, right? So they could use that, that's great. Mm -hmm. You were just looking through the paper here because we've, we've got so much to cover, but it mm -hmm. gives, sense of, gives people a sense of what's going on. Terrible situation out in San Francisco and in other parts of America where Asian Americans, East Asian Americans to be particular, are being uh, attacked because uh, frankly, President Trump and others had emphasized the Chinese origins of the virus. And uh, you saw yesterday that uh, Jeremy Lin, the basketball player, said that uh, he was, uh, people criticized, you know, used a slur against him because of the virus. So you're seeing that. Yeah, Sri, do you, do you think that the player who, um, the player who uh, called him that, if, if it did in fact happen, um, do you think that player is going to be identified publicly and uh, cut from the team and effectively shunted off to, you know, whatever um, team uh, or whatever league outside of the United States is willing to take him in? I don't know. I will we'll, we'll see how mm -hmm. that plays out. I, th I think the yeah. NBA has done a good job of all the leagues. I think I have I have great faith in the NBA and Adam Silver's leadership. So let's see how that all uh, plays mm -hmm. out. Making room for black history. A day to remember Frederick Douglass expands to a week to honor black achievements and then grows to a month. And that's what you're seeing here on today's the last day of Black History Month. Uh, election fraud myth fuels GOP push to redo laws. Uh, something like 35 states are uh, pushing to make voting more difficult uh, because of what happened in the last election. Just awful. because too many because too many, too many people, people voted. Yeah. Voted. Yeah. I, is that is that the stated reason? Yeah. Well, they don't say it that way, but the wrong people voted. I think they would say that. Uh, I love reading obituaries. What about you? Uh, I, so um, when I was an intern for the Daily Hampshire Gazette, an afternoon newspaper in Northampton, Massachusetts, um, uh, I spent, you know, I, I would get to the paper at uh, five o'clock every morning and there would be messages on my voicemail from the funeral homes. And I had, had to get those right. Every word, every spelling, five in the morning for, from five to nine. I got those things done and, you know, we checked them like mad. And, you know, that was that was my first real paid gig in journalism. So yes, I love and appreciate them. Here is uh, Raji Cook 90 who helped make sense of public spaces. And he was a designer who made some of these very now obvious uh, design icons that we all know. And this is an obit by Neil Genslinger, who has been a guest on our show twice. And he's a fantastic writer and a great interview. And uh, what, what, what are your interests in sports? Uh, I have yet to write a story for sports. Um, I have a story that I'm not going to talk about here mm -hmm. that's a feature story that's been on my list for 
at least six years. Uh, and um, there was a glimmer of it in my last book, a sort of preview of it. That's all I'm going to say. This might be the summer that I get it done if they take it. Um, my interest, um, my interest uh, you know, I grew up five blocks from Wrigley Field. So was a lifelong suffering Cubs fan. Um, uh, saw them, you know, win the World Series uh, uh, with my dad uh, in, at his home in Boca when he was just starting to get sick. I was glad that he was able to see that before he died. Um, I grew up playing basketball. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I grew up playing basketball, uh, was in and around Chicago um, or back in Chicago um, for a lot of the amazing Michael Jordan years. You know, there's less time in my life for sports than there used to be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not always thrilled with uh, how these leagues are run and the people um, who own the teams and probably the less um, said about that, the better. Uh, I, I have some trouble right now actually laying out my own money, um, uh, you know, because I, I, I have some issues with with, with um, how, how the whole world of sports operates for that matter. And I probably shouldn't say any more. <laughs> Uh, let's just go back to that photograph, those two photographs. Uh, it was great to see everyone in the Cubs uh, uh, uniforms and uh, outfits there. Uh, but we, you were also at a Bruce Springsteen concert. We mentioned Bruce already. And your, your brother, David. Yeah, so um, David is, a, uh, is, a, uh, is an attorney and um, he specializes in technology, uh, in privacy, uh, in public policy. Uh, he spent uh, a decade or maybe a little bit more uh, at Google, and um, he's now at TikTok. Um, so his 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 days are real quiet right now. I, you know, there's not not a lot to do or talk about <laughs> um, relating to TikTok uh, and privacy. <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, go in and check out the uh, book section. Uh, we only have a few minutes left with you, and so much to cover. Let's talk about the book section. The cover story here is the new book by Viet Thanh. Nguyen, who is the uh, amazing uh, Pulitzer Prize winning writer uh, and uh, his new book reviewed by Juno Diaz. And uh, you were going to talk a little bit about your thoughts on the book review and being a Times writer in the book review. Oh, it's just, you know, I, look, I, I've been incredibly lucky. Uh, my my last two books have been reviewed um, by the Times, the Times Book Review. There's there's no guarantee that that happens, even if you work there. And both reviews have been incredibly generous, uh, very smart um, in their uh, sort of critiques. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of feel blessed and honored. But it's, you know, it's sort of like a complex. I mean, you really don't want to be you know, effectively like de-pantsed, you know, by your <laughs> colleagues or, or in your own institution's pages. And so it, it's fraught, it's fraught. But, you know, if you're lucky and privileged enough to even be able to enter the public sphere in this pay, in this way, then, you know, you put your stuff out there um, for criticism. And, you know, I have a relatively thick skin and, you know, I'm always trying to make it better. And I know I've got another shot with the, um, with the, um, with the paperback. Um, but, uh, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, 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 I felt very luckily, you know, to, to be on the map at all and for the incredibly generous, um, review that, uh, that I got. Yeah. The book promises to help readers apply to choose bargain with and pay for a college to navigate the enormously expensive, intricate and pressure filled system that is higher education in the U S today. I think most folks would agree that America's healthcare system and its education mm -hmm. system are equally screwed up and uh, are, as you said, symptoms of how America deals with its big topics, right? Yep. It, it, both are distinctly American in their complexity and their reliance on um, market forces that are not ideal and highly imperfect. And um, they require, you know, in essence, uh, you know, mastery of complex systems, which involves time and time involves money and not everybody has a lot of money. And if you don't have a lot of money, it's difficult to find good help um, or make time. Uh, and it's not fair. All right, we're just gonna look through the uh, New York Times Magazine. Uh, and uh, there's an interview with Amy Poehler. There's a poem on the occasion of the Confederate flag falling in South Carolina in 2015. Uh, there's Always, we like the ethicist column in the in the Times, a uh, different kind of service, and um, 
uh, question here, should I get COVID-19 vaccine when others need it more? I was, I had an opportunity to get it myself um, early, but it, you know, it said college professors can get it, but you have to teach in-person college and uh, I'm not teaching in person. And so we, I was happy to uh, pass that on to other people. And you hope folks who should be passing uh, do pass it on to the folks who need it. Though uh, there was a story I, I skimmed past when we were looking at the main section, Ron, about how young military folks are turning down the vaccine in droves. Huh. And uh, how to remove graffiti. I always i am amused by this column by uh, Malia Wolin, which often has things that you don't you don't think you'll ever need, but yeah. uh, it's always important to read in case you have a graffiti emergency, for example. Yep. Yeah. And uh, um, this, there's so much to uh, to read here. This is the this is the cover story about Kazuo Izaguro, who is the British uh, novelist born in Nagasaki in, and then moved to the UK when he was five years old. And the book that I read by him was Remains of the Day. And I also saw the movie. He uh, won the Nobel Prize in literature and has a new book out. And speaking of COVID, here's Israel's COVID Ooh. wars. How the pandemic brought tensions between secular and ultra-Orthodox ultra communities to the boiling point. I hope <laughs> they also tackle here the problem of uh, not giving the vaccine to uh, the in the occupied territories. I hope that's also covered here, though this looks like its focus is on the secular versus the ultra-Orthodox. Jump in if you have a thought on any of this. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm glad they did that story. I, I would argue that the, um, the tensions between um, the secular or somewhat secular or more secular and the ultra-Orthodox have, have been at um, uh, a you know, boiling point for decades. Uh, and Ronan, Ron, the, the, uh, who wrote the story, uh, knows that. And, um, uh, you know, those are cover lines that are written by editors and, and you know, and, and they should sell that amazing story as hard as they can. Um, but, uh, you know, that to me, um, I am completely and utterly unsurprised uh, uh, that that um, is taking place in Israel right now, that, that this is, you know, triggering um, uh, a reckoning or a boiling point. Uh, here's an unusual item here. It says a ruckus at the table, the black intimacy of spades by Hanif Abdul Rakib, illustration by John Key. And then they run it again over here. I don't think I've ever seen that. Oh, cool. That's the same, yeah. same so, wording. Yeah. So I, I saw that. I saw that story and didn't um, uh, and haven't read it yet. And I'm not a card player. But this is one of those situations where you just look at it and you're like, I am just so glad that, um, I, I guess I just wanna like honor the creativity of having thought of that as a story idea, because as soon as you see it, you're like, oh yeah, I knew that that was a thing. I had heard that that was a thing. How come ne nobody ever wrote the essay actually documenting how and why it happens and you know, kind of what it means you know, culturally and what it means in black communities. It's just such a brilliant story idea. And these things just sit around for decades and then somebody finds them and we're lucky enough to have the space to run them. Are you a puzzler? I am not. Okay. I'm really bad at it actually. People are sometimes surprised to hear that, but um, I just, I can't, I, I can't do it. I can't, um, I, I don't know if it's a mental block or I don't know, are you? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I don't do this. I do try on the app to do spelling bee uh -huh. to, that was uh, fun. Every, every day. And uh, yeah. I've never reached the genius level. So I, need, I, work, <laughs> I have work to do there. All right. We're yeah. almost out of time. We did want to show in the Sunday review. First of all, Carl's, Carl Zimmer's story, Are Viruses Alive? And, and uh, he's a great science writer uh, who I've admired for a long time. And there's a wonderful uh, piece here. Uh, by a nurse. And uh, Neil, do you want to just jump in here and uh, talk about this for a minute? Sure, Shri. Um, there, it's a nurse, uh, Teresa Jones. The, the basic premise is- Teresa is, Brown. Uh, Teresa Brown, sorry. The basic premise, of course, is that nursing is incredibly challenging in good times. Uh, nurses, I think, are undervalued. Um, you know, an incredible part of the care delivery system. Under COVID, uh, it's 
like for everyone, all of our frontline workers, it's been incredible. And there are profiles of several nurses um, in this, this story, just their first person accounts. Um, I think uh, in the beginning of the uh, pandemic, there were several uh, stories. I think uh, Nick Kristoff might have done one where he actually went you know, into hospitals to kind of offer that perspective. Um, so I think this is just another in that series of first person uh, narratives that we need to really honor and uh, pay attention to. Uh, there's also a really interesting uh, video uh, uh, piece that we can share uh, real quick. It's just, I just wanna play the first minute of, uh, of this video, um, Death Through a Nurse's Eyes. Um, so I'm just gonna pull that up real quick. Um. I was looking through the window of a COVID ICU, and that's when I realized I might see someone die. I didn't even know who she was, but I was filled with immense grief as she edged closer to death by the hour. What I didn't know yet was that by the time I left just two days later, at least three patients would be dead. The vaccine offers hope. But the sad truth is that the virus continues its brutal slaughter in ICUs like this one in Phoenix, Arizona. The only people allowed in are our healthcare workers. They're overworked and underpaid in a deluged hospital. I wanted to know what it is like for them now, after a year of witnessing so much death. Right. Eager to show us their daily reality, two nurses wore cameras so that for the first time, we could see the ICU through their eyes. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna pause the video here. This is a 15 minute piece that the New York Times put together, uh, which I definitely think is um, a great example of the journalism Ron was talking about earlier, service journalism. It's not just the work that, that Ron's been doing. And, and Ron, first of all, I just wanna thank you uh, for everything you shared earlier on a personal note this was incredibly hard for me to produce and listen to everything you were sharing at the same time to try and take it in. Um, but the this this video that we were watching, um, you know, this is a, an, a, an expansion of what the New York Times is doing. It's not just we, we celebrate print every week, but every now and then we dip into their website to show some of the great stuff they do online, uh, whether it's design, whether it's the layout where there's the use of video. So I definitely encourage folks to watch uh, the full 15 minute video when they can. Yeah, the thing that I find so striking about that video, that video does better than than photography may in, may, may in this instance, is it's just an incredibly visceral sense of how much risk those healthcare workers are taking on. The way they are kitted out and, and dressed up to try to avoid dying themselves or getting very sick it, it's just astounding. Uh, you know, the day-to-day -day burden must be extraordinary and um, bless them. And, and one of the things that um, you know, should be noted, and I think we may have mentioned it on the show earlier as well, a number of uh, healthcare professionals, uh, nurses, uh, et cetera, that have died from COVID, uh, a very large percentage of them are Asian American. Uh, if you think of the number of Filipina, Filipino, Filipina nurses out there, in particular, Asian Indian, uh, doctors, medical professionals. Um, it is staggering. Um, there, there's so many, I mean, in terms of, we're not focusing on COVID today as such, but with the nurses uh, piece, it's bringing up all these uh, uh, issues in terms of the impact on communities passing 500,000 uh, deaths um, last week, uh, the impact on uh, people of color and minority communities, uh, and the impact on education, the economy, and it's just uh, staggering to think about it, and and you've written about it uh, as well in terms of the the impact. You know, what does how does COVID impact people's ability to pay for school, and and what options do people have? Um, what is the the stimulus bill? How does that actually help people with that? It's all it's all related. Yeah, uh, just yep. yeah. I as soon as I get off, I'm going back at round three of stimulus. Um, yeah. That's my that's my task for today. I, I did want to ask you about uh, the college forgiveness movement, uh, college debt forgiveness movement. What is your quick take on that? I know it's it's a complicated issue. It's so messy, Street, that I don't even know what to call it, right? If you call it forgiveness, that sort of implies that somebody did something wrong. 
And if anybody did anything wrong here, it was America conducting a 1.7 trillion with a T dollar economic experiment on teenagers over over a generation. So you know, it's 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 America that needs to be forgiven, if anyone. Uh, if you refer to it as cancellation, um, uh, you know that gets a bunch of people angry. Um, who didn't take on any debt and who aren't right now, um, but maybe they didn't because they're more affluent and they didn't have to. Um, I, you know, I, I guess my feeling about it is uh, is this: um, uh, we should um, be having the larger conversation about how we got here, because you know we can forgive or cancel all the debt that we want, but we're continuing to accrue it at, you know, roughly 100 billion with a B dollars um, per year. And so we're just gonna be right back where, where we started, you know, if we do some one kind of jubilee, one time jubilee. Um, and so, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to have that conversation in the public sphere. Well, thank you. And I know you're someone who can help us lead, help lead that conversation and help us understand uh, what an incredible 90 minutes with you. I just want Neil to come back here because I know he said it was hard to produce this. One of the reasons I know for him is when you're talking about your father, uh, Ron, Neil, Neil and I think about his dad. Neil's dad has played a role in this show. Uh, Neil's father passed away almost a decade ago now. And when he did, he was a journalist here in New York uh, who ran a, uh, an Indian American newspaper. And when he died, he asked for the Sunday New York Times uh, print edition to be uh, in the casket before the cremation. And this incredible, I get goosebumps uh, telling that story, which Neil has allowed us to mention multiple times in the show. And to have both of you talk about your dad's uh, means that I, of course, think about my my father and just everyone who's missing relatives in this time, even if they're with us or not with us, just because we're not all able to be together. And so I'm thinking of of, of my family as well. And thank you both for uh, sharing. You know, when you have your own grief, sharing it with the world helps folks. So even if we don't tell you that enough, I want to say that to both of you. Thank you for opening up and and talking about that. Thank you. Thank you, Shri. Um, you know, I was focusing more on on the um, on my daughter in terms of the college savings, and uh, you know, when I when I read uh, the column, uh, Ron, and and you know, your stories about your your father, but more the the process, the pl financial planning process. You know, we're we're very lucky that uh, my father did um, take uh, steps uh, in terms of uh, you know insurance, in terms of financial planning, the house, et cetera. Uh, that my mom is is doing well and and you know we're doing well, um, but you see so many people who are not in that position who who um, even with an illness, even with some lead time, they just don't um, have the wherewithal to organize uh, their finances to do the estate planning, um, and uh, yeah. it really does it does make a huge difference. And we're blessed uh, that you know you had great resources you could tap into and still had some challenges. Uh, and had to figure things out. Um, and so I certainly uh, want to encourage everyone, you know, I mean, come, there, there's so much you can take from this show, whether it's focusing on your kid's college, focusing on your parents and financial planning. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that piece was very touching. Um, and uh, it really did, um, it, it was very, very emotional. And, and Ron, I want to thank you we started off uh, the, the conversation just laying bare. What an incredible month uh, to go through the last two months in terms of your your book coming out, your uh, hitting hitting the bestseller list number four, your father's passing, uh, continuing with the with the book tours, sharing that emotion. One of the things that I appreciate about the read along is that we do keep it very real. We do keep it very raw when we have to, um, and we're not afraid of shying away from that emotion. Thank you for bringing that and being bringing your authentic self to today's show. Thank you. I appreciated having the opportunity. All right, Ron, well, we'll let you go. We have some housekeeping to do, but thank you very, very much. And everyone, please follow Ron on Twitter. He's incredible, at Ron Lieber. And please get his book, The Price You Pay for College. We even heard the story of the title and how it came together. There's a Springsteen connection in there. So if you missed that, all of that, we will start as soon as we're off the air. 
It'll replay on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Please share this with your friends. Please tag your friends so they can see it. And here are so many great comments coming through. Thanks very much, Ron. Thank you. Bye-bye. And another awesome show. And we want to remind everyone we have uh, great speakers lined up coming up next week and the week after. We want to just let you know, 8.30 a.m. Sundays, uh, Cheryl McCarthy will be with us from CUNY's one-to-one -one interview show. And then Ralph Blumenthal, who, as you can see, spent a long time at the New York Times, decades there, will be with us on March 14th. And we want to thank our wonderful team of producers. Uh, Neil Parikh is executive producer. And we have with us Carla Baranakis at Kabara, Steve Taylor at Steve DeReeve, Paula Kiger at Big Green Pen, at Julia Weeks, Julia at Julia L. Weeks, and Neil is at Neil Parikh. And we want to give a shout out, Neil, as we always do, to the local connection. Absolutely. Uh, the local connection is a great newsletter. Um, we want to thank uh, Carla Baranakis uh, from through the uh, Montclair Uni State University. So the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University brings the local connection newsletter every week. Uh, it offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. Best of all, it's free and you can subscribe at bit.ly slash local news tips, B-I-T dot L-Y slash local news tips. Uh, definitely encourage you to take a look uh, and uh, there's Ron uh, giving a shout out to the A-team. That's our production team. Again, uh, Paula and Steve and Julia and Carla, thank you for all the work uh, that you do every week to make this show a success. Uh, Spree, after this show, uh, you're actually going to be taking my role and uh, helping to produce She's On Call. Can you tell us about this week's episode? Yeah, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Marina Korean are hosting this incredible show, She's On Call, every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And today, we're talking about children's emotional, physical, and educational health. And we have the president of uh, the AAPRES with us and uh, Robin Kogan, who is uh, a registered nurse, will be talking about uh, various aspects of this. So you do not want to miss the show. 11 a.m. Eastern on She's on call on all the platforms and as well as on my LinkedIn. So you can watch that there. So please tune in and big shout out to our team that produces it. Rose Horowitz, Julia Weeks, Vandana Menon. It was great to work with them. And a reminder, folks, that when Ron uh, Thomas called us the A-team, that's our DigiMentors team. We do these shows and other digital consulting, including conferences, uh, virtual summits, webinars, etc. So if you'd like uh, to work, have us work with you, please get in touch. We would love to talk to you about opportunities uh, that we can work with you. So please get in touch. And thank you very much, everyone. We also want to give a shout out to the Spin It Social Hour, where photographers share their work and journeys. And uh, our friend Stefan Kaplan, who's part of DigiMentors, is, in, is interviewing Tai Chi, uh, who is a terrific photojournalist. So please do tune in on Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Absolutely, so thank you very much. Just wanna uh, thank uh, folks, Tim Sohn, uh, thanking us for the work uh, the work we're doing. Hemily uh, saying great team. Um, Patricia Freudenberg again, amazing episode. Uh, it, it seems like every every week we do, it's it's even better. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine how we can top uh, every week. Uh, Rose Horowitz, as you mentioned earlier, uh, helping to produce She's On Call, um, and Linda Lawrence as well. So just want to thank everyone for watching. You know, the, the most important thing uh, I want to say, and, you know, Shree's been doing this for five, we're now in the sixth year of the uh, New York Times Read Along. To me, the most important thing is the community that we've built up uh, every every week. Uh, we share the news. Shree likes to call us crazy people for taking out the Sunday Times and reading it on uh, social media. I don't think it's that crazy personally, um, but I just love that so many people come back week after week uh, to share this, uh, that we bring, have great guests, that people engage with the, with the show. And, and really that's why we do it for this, this camaraderie and this uh, experience every Sunday morning. So thank you to our viewers for making the show such a success. Thanks very much, everybody. And Neil, thanks for leading us on this. And everyone, check out 
uh, his Twitter thread, which really sums up all the things and the good things to watch for in the paper. Also, want to do a quick mention uh, that today's the last day at the Washington Post of Marty Barron, uh, the longtime uh, editor there who has done an incredible job as uh, one of the most successful runs of any editor anywhere. And today's his last day. And uh, in my newsletter, we uh, we talk a little bit about Marty, and you can find my newsletter, srinet.substack.com, srinet.substack.com. If you're, a, there's a photo of me and him in the before times, as we call it, but it's also uh, in praise of journalism holding big tech accountable. So srinet.substack. Thanks very much, everybody, and have a great, great Sunday. Bye-bye.